Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Mindplex podcast. This is uh, the second time that we've had Rajiv Bio on and Kennedy Shaw. Actually, the third time we've had Kennedy Shaw on, the fly queen. But today we have Axel Shoemaker, who is the chief biotech um, chief biotech officer at That's right. uh, at, at Rajiv Biotech. And uh, I actually think of him as a, a much bigger thing, which is the father of the epigenic uh, theory of, of aging and um, someone who I've watched in the field without realizing it until I realized who he was the other night when I was really getting into him and looking him up. So it's very exciting to have him on the show. Welcome, Axel. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Ben Gortzel will be here soon. And of course, we have the lovely Grace Robot. Grace, say hello. Hello, everybody. And uh, let's uh, dig into it. Um, you guys have a very exciting announcement that I wanted to make sure to start off the show with because um, it, to me, the, the pieces of the puzzle that it puts together that you helped me put together before the show um, is this whole idea about longevity research and how a lot of the things that are discovered through longevity research end up doing other great things in medicine. And it's not just so if people can live forever or live longer than the normal health span, uh, lifespan, which a lot of people think is just, you know, crazy rich people trying to live forever. Um, but I'm, I'm one of those people that wants to extend my, my lifespan just to kind of put that on the table. I'm, I'm not that critical of these technologies because I want them to succeed. I think, I think it could work, but the thing that keeps coming up in my research are the the other wonderful things that you're kind of discovering along the way. And uh, and that's what it seemed like uh, today. And I will uh, let the two of you take it away however you want to, uh, to let people know about this. Well, I mean, just to touch on what you just said there, and, and then we'll let um, Axel do the big announcement. Um, we, uh, you know, if you think about aging as a process, and then you think about it in terms of chronic disease, 90% of all chronic diseases are actually caused by the aging process. As people live longer, as medicine advances, and we have longer lives, it makes us more prone to a lot of other different diseases. Um, you know, cancer probably being the best example of that. Um, I read an article just the other day that cancer rates are expected to surge up to 77% as people are living longer. Well, that's something that we need to mm. take care of. Cancer is a devastating disease. It, it, it damages a lot of um, people and families, and it is it is at its core a dece disease of aging. You know, cancer wasn't so prevalent back when we were only living 35 years. It's become prevalent as we've as we've um, li lived longer. Yeah. So um, yeah. So the idea is that as we live longer, a lot of things that would have taken you know. 20, 30 years, 40 years to develop, get the chance to develop that didn't get the chance to, to develop before. And, um, and that's why, in a way, when we talk about this disease of aging, aging as a disease, we're sort of curing the symptoms one by one. And um, having cancer somewhere would certainly be, you know, be, be one of those symptoms. And that's something, of course, we want to, uh, this, this pathway we want to disrupt. But we need to disrupt the pathways that lead us to the disease. I mean, what we are doing at Rejuve Bio is obviously we are looking for um, tools and supplements and pharmaceuticals to uh, help us living longer. But what good is it if we die from other causes that are not directly related to our normal aging process? This could be cancer. This could be running under a bus. We don't have a solution for that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but we have uh, one new project and uh, that is dealing with um, the early detection of lung cancer. And this is obviously, um, lung cancer is a massive problem because it's uh, firstly widespread all over the planet. Um, people get lung cancer. There are over 2 million people that are getting diagnosed each year. And unfortunately, most of them die. So it's really the vast majority of them die. 
And you can have the best uh, longevity protocol in the world. If you get the cancer, that's it. And um, if your cancer is detected too late, that's it. There's not much we can do. There are no drugs for it. If you're, um, And this is a massive problem in lung cancer because usually when people uh, go into the clinic, they have some chest pain or whatever is going on. They're coughing. They're going to the clinic and then the doctors find out, oh, sorry, but you have lung cancer. And at that stage, usually the cancer spread already around the body and it's just too late. So what we have to do is what is urgently needed is um, an early screening mechanism that helps people to find the cancer at such an early stage that it's still treatable. And we know that if you catch it early on, like we have, to, we have several stages in lung cancer from one to four. If you catch it in, in phase one or stage one, the chances of survival are fantastic, like are over 90%. If you catch it at phase three or four, it's almost zero. So what we are doing now is basically we want to uh, see how can we use our AI to um, screen for early lung cancer indirectly. So we are uh, we partnered up with uh, Aerium Bioscience, that's a Dutch biotech, and they are uh, they work on a six protein marker panel that can detect early lung cancer, but still in a very early uh, development. And um, so basically, we partner to see if we can use information that they get from their measurements like with, with uh, immunochemistry in blood or this mass spectral photometry from blood samples can we use this data to make even a better judgment if a person has cancer or not or even another lung uh, disease um, there are several other diseases that could uh, in the early stages look like lung cancer but there are or you have to distinguish between um, cancers that are actually benign and the really uh, dangerous cancers. So not every person that has some um, nodule in, in the lung um, needs to be treated. A lot of them are, they will be fine. But by understanding the data behind it, so we can make this massive difference. And that's where we go in. So we try to build basically a, a platform using the AI capabilities that we have at Richu Bio and helping them out, getting their data, putting this all together and see how we can uh, build a platform that helps doctors um, finding lung cancer early in their patients and then see what can be done now. And um, of course, I think this is something that if this works out uh, and we, we reach that point in a few years, um, screening for diseases like lung cancer, but not only that, there are also other uh, diseases you don't want to get. In, as part of your longevity routine, your longevity lifestyle is, is super important and we should go there. Mm. So not only focusing on on drugs and supplement and healthy lifestyle, but also on screening mechanisms that are evidence-based and that can tell you, look, watch out, you may be in danger of getting disease A, B, or C. Wow. And then so the information is is um, given to an AI for the AI to analyze and sort of tell you all the things that it, that it could be, that it might be, or just as starting off with what it should be as a normal thing and then looking at any irregularities. And how often do you think you'd be getting these screenings? Once a year? Well, in, in, in the case of lung cancer, it makes sense to do it about once a year. And it depends also on uh, on, on your uh, sex like um, and uh, your family history of cancer, uh, if you smoke or not, and or if you got exposed to dangerous substances that are bad for the lungs, like asbestos, and uh, which is a big problem, uh, for example, in the US, that people that build, uh, rebuild their houses, they're often exposed to asbestos, and that predisposes 
individuals to lung cancer. So in that case, it really makes sense to let's to do let every year or at least every second year, um, and probably more often if you're older, to just uh, go to your doctor and the doctor can just take a blood sample of you and sends it into a lab to see if there's something developing in your lungs. So this makes absolutely perfect sense for the individual and for the whole uh, healthcare ecosystem, because it's a massive difference. Just imagine a test may cost a couple of hundred dollars, but every person that gets lung cancer, that the treatment on average costs almost on average one million dollars. So, whoa, you see. Who the hell's got a million dollars if they get cancer? It's massive. Uh, of course, if you, are, if you have cancer, of course, you don't care. First of all, you don't pay for it. But it's a massive oh. burden. It's a massive burden for the healthcare system, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, they say you don't pay for it, but you, you'll pay something for it. Probably you you might, they'll have some co-pays. It, yeah. It's going to be expensive. You know, it's not going to be nothing. And it, it's really a lengthy. It's just a, it's a process. You want to avoid if you if you can and it's interesting because you know screening for lung cancer specifically you know my friends who have gotten lung cancer over the years you don't know until like you start coughing up blood or you know you can't breathe right anymore right like it it becomes a, something becomes a problem and by then yeah it's usually pretty far gone and it's just a question of how long they have or something, right? You know, how right. long they have. And one friend of mine was doing all these amazing things. Um, Mark Perkel is his name. He was coming up, he actually managed to get doctors to help him, to give him experimental treatments and things because he was going to die anyway. There's something, maybe you guys can explain this because I'm not going to do it very well. There's something where if you've, oh, good, Ben is here. Ben is going to be here. Or maybe he's here. You can show him if he's here. I think he's going to be here. But there's something where if you're going to die in six months or a year, whatever, it's less than a year, they'll let you try experimental stuff that, uh, you know, could kill you. Is that the right the right to try law, Lisa? Is that yeah, right to try. Yeah. That's it. Maybe that's a California thing. We were here in California. Anyway, he did it and he was doing great. And then everything came back and he died in like yeah. three months. Like it was it was incredible. And uh, And during the time before the three months, though, you know, he had like no symptoms, but mm -hmm. when they first found it, yeah, it was his breathing. You know, it gets to that state. Oh, and he Ben, he loves this is new look. Hello, Ben. Hey, hey. How are you? Hey, this Looking is just good. normal. This is just normal for Ben now. This is his new look. We shouldn't make purple, this purple, purple wig and it. leopard hat. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's it's, it's all those... today. How are you doing? Well, I've been suffering some uh, side effects from the human growth hormone that uh, that Axel prescribed me, actually. Oh but, uh, no! Yeah, but uh, other other than, other than that, it's 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 all good. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. You're looking you're looking good. Um, all right. I'm gonna try yeah. some of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. So, we're, Ben, we were just talking about uh, the announcement, the, the Rajiv Bio uh, partnership. Um, uh, I'm trying looking searching for, with Arian. Uh, to uh, detect, come up with a solution for helping to detect lung cancer in the very, very yeah. early stages. So that's where we are. Yeah. Um, if there's anything you'd like to say about that, that's where we are. Oh, I, I mean, I think uh, Axel and Kennedy probably okay. know, about, <laughs> know about that one. I mean, this is a... Yeah, this yeah. Is a, yeah. It's a sort of machine learning application that's been possible for about 20 years now, really. And there's been research papers and all this. And I mean, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to see this sort of application rolling out in, in practice as has happened in the last few years. I mean, I mean, it's taken, taken longer than I would have thought for this sort of thing to get out of the lab. Like I remember in 2005 or something, I published a paper on, you know, identifying lung cancer based on gene expression ba based on on samples from tumors and so on so the it's been shown that you could do this quite accurately with modern biology technology and ml for for quite a while but we're we're really rolling it out now which is uh yeah. which is which is amazing huh? 
And it's yeah. not only the, the, the early screening, what I mentioned before. Of course, we have to catch the cancer as early as possible with uh, multi-omics where the AI can then dive deep into the data and figure out what's going on. But also in the, in the second case that uh, you mentioned before, like when people are already diagnosed with lung cancer or any other cancer, you want to give them a treatment that actually works, not try out um, medication A, medication B. And then once you have tried the tense uh, drug, they're dead, right? So you want to figure it out. In the ideal case scenario, you want to give the AI as much data as you can. The AI tells you, look, you take drug 15 in our list and that's the one that works and the others they will not work and this was this is where we have to go and i'm sure it's only we are not so far away from that point yeah they do that a little bit now when people have cancer and they test uh, to at least they know the ones that kind of like won't work for whatever reason they can face or the ones that seem to have side effects maybe for you because of something and things like that because my friends that had cancer treatments seem to have a lot less experimenting along those lines than the people 20 years ago that seemed to have to go through one horrible thing after another. I mean, from my perspective, it right. seemed like one horrible thing after another. Um, hey, was any of the fly data, it, it, that's more in the the pharmaceuticals than anything well, that has to so do with I, I mean, if you, dig in, if you dig into the details, I mean, the the flies, flies tend not to die of cancer so much. So, I mean, I mean cancer is one of the, it's probably the main among the causes of human aging that the fly model is is actually less useful less useful for the thing the thing you find with flies and and cancer is is more so that some of the things that would prolong life in flies will work great on humans some of the things that would prolong life in flies might cause cancer in humans or you know by diminishing the function of tumor suppressor cells or something. So you sort of have a logic like if we could merely solve the small problem of curing cancer, then you could pour it over everything that makes uh, flies and other model organisms live a long time. You could pour that over much, much more easily to, 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 to humans. So, I mean, these things, they all, they all fit together, but this, this particular thing with lung cancer is not, so much related to the Methuselah fly data, but it all connects in the AI's knowledge base, right? I mean, the AI has data from long-lived flies, it has data from yeast and other model organisms, from mice, from from rats, and above all data from humans. And the AI mm -hmm. can connect all of this, all of this data together. But the in terms of the fly data, the main thing you want to have the AI understand is like which of the things that works on a fly will not bump into cancer related pathways in humans in in the wrong way. But then you do want to understand the cancer related pathways and you want the AI to understand it for that reason. Right. And um, fl flies have yeah, had, actually, they have successfully been used as a model for epithelial cancers. Um, and I've, I worked with a, another student at UC Irvine who used them as a successful model for um, ovarian cancer as well. Um, of course, those, those flies, um, they were models. And so they, were, they had um, cancer induced in them. They didn't naturally, naturally get cancer. But the way that um, a cancer, the growth of cancer will affect Drosophila is still a good model for mimicking how... Um, tumor biology and cancer biology will will proliferate in humans as well. Yes, and the audience is asking, um, flies can get cancer? What kind of cancers do flies get? Well, they, they, can get, they can get a lot of kinds of cancer in principle. It's just, it's just not a major cause of, of death for them because other things... Oh, okay, I think. That thing, that, yeah. Okay, but what kinds... Kennedy, I want your... I want yeah, the queen's um, take on this. Flies, flies mostly get um, epithelial cancer. So cancers that are um, related to like kind of their their outer membranes of either the larval stage or the the um, the adult like body stage. So like it'd be it'd be roughly like if you were going to say like what's the human like equivalent to that, like skin skin cancer, basically. So okay. 
Interesting. And and then they want to know what do flies die of then if if cancer isn't one of the major causes? They literally fall apart. Ben <laughs> 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 doesn't kill them yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've I've killed quite a few. I have to say. Yeah. Well, don't say anything like that on the show. We don't want any any Methuselah flies watching the show to hear about those horrible experiences. But seriously, so what do you mean they fall apart? Tell us more. That sounds great. Well, they stop. I mean, they stop being able to like really move very well. So like their, um, you know, their their joints, their legs, their wings. They get old. Yeah, they they get they yeah they get old. Okay. They, <laughs> the ones my my Methuselah flies, my super long lived flies, towards the end of their life, they literally don't really move about the cage. You can see them kind of come to like a standstill, basically towards the end. Oh of their yeah, life. you see that all the time. The bugs, you think they're dead, and I leave them alone just in case, you know. And then like they'll like walk along a little bit and then just stay there, you know, for a long time. So right. um, the thing with the flies um, that I wondered is if they, like, uh, first of all, just real quick so we can make it clear, normal fly li lifespan compared to Methuselah fly lifespan. Yeah, so normal li fly lifespan is about four to six weeks. Methuselah fly lifespan right now, I have them at about seven months. So Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then, um, Grace, I think you had a question along these lines. Five. Has Rejuve Biotech encountered any unexpected or surprising findings during the analysis of Methuselah fly genomic data? How have these findings influenced your research and development process? Um, some interesting findings with the fly genomic data. Well, um, kind of our our first sort of uh, proof of, proof of concept study was the finding of um, some neurological pathways that the flies also have that are um, orthologous to human neurological pathways, in particular how humans get Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, we were able to use an earlier version of our AI platform to identify not only those pathways, but traditional Chinese herbs and medicines that act on those pathways. And um, carrying that all the way through from fly studies, making our control flies live longer, um, using that combination of herbs in a um, fly model <laughs> for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, um, in which we uh, restored the locomotion of those flies. You know, you can't, if you have a fly model for Alzheimer's disease, you can't ask a fly where it left its car keys, right? Um, but what happens is they stop being able to crawl up the sides of their cages and vials. And so um, giving them this combination of herbs that was identified by, by the AI um, was able to restore their crawling ability and restore their lifespan. We also were able to take that that same combination and take it all the way through to a human pilot, uh, uh, Alzheimer's patients, and just adding this uh, supplement to their normal regimen of drugs, we were able to help people maintain their cognitive function over the course of a 15-month pilot. And so um, some of those pathways that uh, were activated in, in that study are some of your um, aging-related disease uh, pathways that you hear a lot about, uh, the MPK pathway, mTOR, um, very um, pathways that are really involved in um, kind of keeping inflammation in check in the body. Um, so that's something that we've had pretty, that's been interesting over, over the course of, course of our studies, so. I would say, I mean, Kennedy has given very practical answer, which is great. I would say, to me, some of the more interesting things to come out of the whole fly project have been even more at the population genetic level rather than just at what particular genes or, or pathways are important. So, I mean, just first of all, just the sheer number of genes that are different in the long lived flies. Like there's 14,000 or something fly genes, more than 2,000 seem to be significantly variant in the. O flies like 10, 12, 15 years ago, even, right? So, just the, the broad nature of the genetic differences we now take for granted, but was interesting. Like at first, it wasn't clear. It could have been concentrated, 
the changes could have been concentrated in a few places. Then the magnitude, the magnitude of the changes between the O flies from a decade ago and the super O flies now is also striking. Like in many ways, the differences between the O flies, which had like double control fly lifespan, and the super O flies we have now, which lives longer. The differences between O and Super O in many ways are more than the differences between the original control flies and the and the the O flies. So like we're not it's not like we've capped out the amount of changes you get. Rather with the on ongoing evolution that, that Candy has been has been directing, we're actually the 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 genetic changes if anything, would seem to be amp amping up, right? Which is, which is, is also quite, quite interesting. And it's not just that there's a lot of genes, they span so many different pathways, right? Like there's immune, immune related genes, there's heart, heart related genes, there's, there's brain, there's brain related genes. There, there, there's also a whole interesting story that Kennedy or Axel could probably tell more about in terms of the the evidence that the fly data gives for the existence of a sort of late life phase in organisms as 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 distinct from the sort of old age old age phase so like you have you have infancy yeah. you have youth you have adulthood you have old age and there's some some folks in the genetics of aging who believe there's there's a phase of life which is called late life which is different than than old age where in, in in some ways your your rate of decline has stabilized even though it may it may have stabilized at a high rate but your rate of decline has has stabilized so your your odds of dying in your 120th year may not be a lot different than your odds of dying in your 121st year or something if, if the late life hypothesis is right right it's the, the late life plateau oh, that's I interesting referring to ben yeah. yeah yeah tell us tell us more about that either one of you yeah, so the late life plateau, as Ben said, it, it's basically where you where you hit a point where, um, you know, you're very old and your odds of dying um, haven't necessarily decreased, but they're not increasing either. So, um, I mean, an example I can give in real life is um, my my grandfather in law just passed away at at 104 in um, July, and you have somebody like that who has lived at a relatively constant state of health for by that point, 20, 15 years, you know, his odds of, of dying every day stay the same. Whereas if you take like the odds of somebody dying in their thirties versus their odds of somebody dying in their eighties, it goes up. Well, once it gets up there, it, it kind of just stays the same. And so you do see that in the, in the long lived um, Methuselah flies as well. When you get to a point in their lifespan, um, usually in the last, uh, well, in the Methuselahs now, it's like the last like couple of months of flies, uh, of their fly lifespan, hardly any of them are dying. Now, up to that point, there's been, there's been deaths, of course, but you get to this late lifetime where hardly any flies are dying. It's much less than it would normally be early on in, in, in life when when um, you know selective forces are, are at their strongest in terms of evolutionary um, conservation of of life, so right. Yeah. So having a centigenarian in the family, were you like coming over all the time just to draw blood and get? Sorry, Grandpa, <laughs> but I gotta like get some <laughs> test data from you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He he uh, he did give his cheek swab to like I think the uh, the. Um, was it the uh, bone marrow registry? So that those those genetic information is is somewhere. So oh, okay, but you didn't actually get it and analyze Can I it. Jump in here? I did. I did not swab them myself. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. But yeah, yeah, Lisa or Grace, go, going back to the the higher level point, I think there's there's two sorts of lessons you can get from model organisms like Methuselah flies. And you get those same two types of lessons from applying AI to an integrated biodata knowledge base, really. So one one aspect is just generally understanding how aging works and how longevity can be achieved. And I think, I mean, Michael Rose, who who founded the Methuselah Fly Project, made a bunch of headway on that. 
Axel made a bunch of headway on that with his uh, understanding of epigenesis and in, in, in aging and so forth. And I mean, I think I think I think I think that there's still more lessons to be learned there, right? And I mean, some of these are lessons that yes. are now broadly taken for granted, like oh, there's no one pathway where you fix it and you won't age. Like it cuts across different systems, cuts across different different levels of the organism. I mean, the the role of antagonistic pleiotropy in aging, like genes serving different functions at different phases of life, and a gene that was useful at one point is in harmless harmful at, at a later point. I mean, this point, which is made abundantly, for example, in the work of Jean Pedro de Magalais, who's one of our advisors in Rejuve Biotech. So there's a bunch of broad lessons like this are driven home and enriched both by the by the work with long the flies and by our work applying AI to the genomics and the epigenomics of aging more broadly. And then when you get to therapeutics discovery, then suddenly you have the question, okay, well, that's nice. We understand what are the dynamics of aging somewhat. Now, give me a very small number of targets that we can hit with some with some substance, right? And that's the fact that you're pushed to that question is really just the limitations of our modern technology for delivering therapies, right? Because I mean, mo most most biological networks that have a big impact on the body are not just driven by a handful of different genes or a handful of different <coughs> molecular targets, right? I mean, they're mostly driven by a lot of different genes working together in different systems of the body on different scales. But we don't, and a lifestyle intervention can affect that, like eating better or exercising more can affect all these different parts of your body, have a very broad-based effect. But on the other hand, there are limits to how much of a longevity boost you get from lifespan interventions, and you don't seem to be increasing the maximum lifespan of humans that way, just the sort of average lifespan, the lifespan of, of, of an individual, at least based on what we know so far. So it seems you can get a more powerful impact by delivering a gene theory or a pharmaceutical or something. But yet with the current technologies, you can only poke a small number of targets without running into practical issues of causing side effects or just things don't hit the target and, and so forth. So that that's really a major challenge that we're confronting on the AI side is you're given some, you're given a situation where the real natural way to cure the problem of aging is just to hit a shitload of targets at once, right? And when you know, once, once you have nanomedicine, <clears throat> yeah, just re release a bunch of little nanobots into your body, hit all those targets at once, and presto, like virtual immortality. I mean, not quite that simple, but you'd, you'd have a, yeah, <laughs> but, but you, 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 you'd have a much a much better it's, shot at it, right? So yeah, that, like a twenty year presto or something. Like seriously, step by step. Well, I see what you I mean, mean. You know, I mean, if you if you could go in and hit a few hundred targets at once in all the different cells in the body, I mean it is quite possible you could radically prolong human lifespan in, 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 in one go based on genomic and epigenomic. Right. And that would be that the we, treatment that, that, even that based on results our physical or whatever, that we have right, right now. Yeah. It'd be like, yeah. Multi-tissue CRISPR on a hundred targets at once. Right now we, you could do a lot of other things too. You could, you could probably boost the IQ of middle-aged people, right? You could, you could do so many things. Let's I mean, do that the, right away. <laughs> Ch the, Ch the Chinese are the Chinese army is working on it, Lisa. But that yeah. But that, oh, that, geez. Oh, but geez. That, 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 that's that's a, that's a different topic. Yeah. Okay. But so hey, Axel, Axel, I would love for you to follow up on a point that Ben brought up just a little while ago about the yeah. way that the human genetics and the fly genetics and epigenetics <laughs> all work together to do some amazing things. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's a super interesting topic. And that's why I'm so fascinated of what we are actually doing. Um, fly model and other organisms have, of course, a very different genome and a very different epigenome to us humans. And evolving so past this tree of uh, all the species on our, our planet of course we developed different epigenetic patterns different um, biochemical pathways and we do not share everything with all other species that's that's 
quite uh, easy to understand. And of course, some of those biochemical pathways that make us age will have no effect in flies and vice versa. But on the other hand, there are a lot of overlaps also on the epigenetic level. And when we're uh, speaking about um, epigenetics, there, this could be, um, for example, modifications on the DNA itself in the flies and in humans. Mm -hmm. In humans, we have primarily DNA methylation, which reg regulates genes. They will get up or down regulated. So, if the so what usually happens if, if there's um, an interaction with uh, environmental um, factors, uh, and then some pathways are triggered in our cells and small molecules, methylation uh, groups, they attach to the DNA and then switch off. A specific gene and then it's just uh, a protein some hormones not produced anymore this is one of many epigenetic mechanisms mm -hmm. this is not really um widespread in drosophila but there are other dna modifications that we share with drosophila and um, there there are many and the same is true with uh, changes in the what, what we call the histone code so histones is a basically protein elements that uh, where the DNA is wrapped around and this gives the DNA in our cells a three-dimensional structure in the in the nucleus and there are patterns in flies as well as in humans and in yeast so very ancient very old um, patterns that survive through hundreds of millions of years of evolution and those patterns, those mechanisms, they are highly interesting, especially in the context of longevity. Because what, what Ben just described, instead of targeting thousands of different small areas, what we can hope for is that if we basically go to the root that is really evolutionary conserved through hundreds of millions of years, so these biochemical pathways and can stop the aging process for these pathways and then we have then we have basically won the lottery and for for aging against aging this is fascinating because we can test it in the flies and in other model organisms and um, this is what what we do and what we are aiming at and um, these mechanisms they may react to envir environmental stressors and uh, signal then the body to defend the body and this is this is something we have to figure out and we can test all of these um, hypotheses in the flies and whatever we find there with the help of the ai we can then of course apply to potential treatments or supplements or drugs in human beings yeah interesting fascinating and you were saying that we do share some things with the flies um it does is it a direct kind of thing where we used fly lung i think they have lungs right would you use your fly gene lung data for your flat for your human lung detection thing or is there no connection there at all and it's more like the aging, it's the, more about aging in general that you're learning from the flies. There isn't really I mean, any kind of not, one, not, one neither, ratio. Neither, neither, neither one of those is right, Lisa. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> I mean for, the, for, the, for, the, for the lung cancer thing, you're not going based on, on fly data because as, as already stated, lung cancer is not a major oh, thing right. in, in, oh, right. in, in, in flies. However, okay. for, for neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or, or for heart disease, you do have many of the same pathways and you have orthologous genes between flies and humans. So you, you can find huh. out what's causing the fly to get heart disease or neurodegenerative disease. And you can also create model flies that by tweaking their genome in a specific way that, that demonstrate strong Alzheimer's type symptoms and so on. So you, you can do that mapping between fly and human in a fairly precise way for some age-associated diseases. 
it ha it happens that that you can't do that as well for most cancers. M maybe you can for epithelial cancer, which, as, as as Candy mentioned, which I don't know about. You can't you can't. Uh oh. For lung cancer. Sorry, Ben, you cut out a little diseases. bit. Could you repeat what you said? Yeah, what I saw from looking at the pathways involved with neurodegenerative diseases in flies and humans is there are some strictly orthologous genes where it's like a certain gene is involved in Alzheimer's-like symptoms in flies and the exact correlates of those genes, there's reason to believe are involved in Alzheimer's in in humans so you could say well okay if you have a substance that affects these genes and cures neurodegeneration in flies you know maybe the same substance will affect those same genes in humans and then bingo right but there's a lot of other cases which are interesting where you have a certain pattern or process in the flies which has an analogous pattern or process in humans but the mapping is not so exact like fly gene A into fly gene B, fly gene A into human gene B, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's not that precise a mapping. And this yeah, is yeah. actually this is actually where the AI gets more interesting because we can use AI that we have in OpenCog, like abductive reasoning, which is a kind of probabilistic hypothetical reasoning. We can use this kind of AI reasoning to guess, well, this process related to neurodegeneration in flies is analogous to this process related to neurodegeneration in humans and there's some directly orthologous genes involved but not all right so making these approximate mappings between a model organism and and human is sort of cutting edge of ai and it happens to be somewhere where the neural symbolic AI approach that we're taking in the OpenCog Hyperon system. Uh -huh. we're doing, and that we're you're doing. You're off all my questions, Ben. This is great. Tell yeah, me about well, that was my next question. Seriously. Well, was, how does the so, AI fit in and OpenCog fit into this? Yeah. So, I mean, OpenCog is a, uh, it's a software platform we're developing with general intelligence in mind, but before we get to human level AGI, which, could only be a few years now. Things are going fast. But before we get to human level yeah. AGI, uh, five to ten can, years. Before, well, it depends nothing, on nothing. How, fa how fast you're flying. Yeah, but uh -huh. that's uh, okay. Carry I on. I mean, even <laughs> even before we get there, we can apply the open cog framework to a variety of different practical problems. So open cog combines deep neural nets with yeah. other AI mechanisms like probabilistic logical reasoning and evolutionary learning and, and probabilistic programming. And in this particular case, we have a strong application for probabilistic inference, in particular abductive inference or hy hypothesis formation, as I, as I mentioned, because the, uh, th this is what lets you make a guess as to, well, maybe the pattern or process or network in humans that is the closest analogy to this process causing neurodegeneration of flies. Maybe the closest analogy in humans is is, is so and such, right? And OpenCog is yeah. good at, at doing this. So Rajuv Biotech, company Candy is running, is working closely with True AGI, which is a, a company pursuing practical applications of the OpenCog. Yes. Hyperon technology. We have a wonderful but, podcast with Alexi Podimhoff. If you want to learn yeah, more about yeah, yeah, True that's AGI, right, that's right. carry on. So True AGI and Rejuve are working together to bring OpenCog to bear on this on this data. And that's he heavily relevant to neurodegenerative disease, to heart disease, and a, a bunch of other things. I mean, they're there are even interesting parallels regarding immune function, which is weird because mm. the immune system in a fly is so very different than the immune system in, in a mammal. But nevertheless, there seem to be interesting parallels in how immune function affects a fly's lifespan and how immune function affects a, a, hum, a human's lifespan, right? So there's, there's, there's quite a lot 
of interesting things there. Yeah, I, I think for cancer, the analogy reasoning from mice to humans will be more interesting, actually, because we know a lot about how cancer impacts mice and rats. And they're more similar to people, but of course, they're still not people. And there's still a role for the AI analogy reasoning there. I mean, I think the Methuselah flies are a very amazing, powerful, unique source of data because we get a whole organism rather than just some isolated piece. You get a whole organism that lives a long time and not through some hat, but through, you know, an evolutionary approach, which then cuts across all parts yeah. of the organism. But as powerful it is, I mean, it's not the only thing. We're feeding data from every organism we can get our hands on and every tissue we can get our hands on into, into open cog atom space. I mean, I think the fly data is a sort of secret sauce. The open cog AI approach is a different secret sauce. And then the, someone who knows more about cooking than me could come up with a beautiful analogy for mixing two, <laughs> mixing two secret mixing sauces together. together, right? We get yeah. it. We get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Axel, kind of getting back to my original question then, which is going to be a lot easier to understand now, actually, with all that background that, that Ben gave about the how the fly data and the, the fly genomic data and the human genomic data and then the epigenetics, which is where a lot of your expertise comes in, right to, to really start making things happen uh, yeah that's Fill us in. no here, here's the thing what i find so fascinating i'm putting these two sources together as ben describes yeah to mix up something completely new and fantastic is that we can basically in the first time in our research history in our human research history um can build completely new hypotheses specifically to longevity because if you look back and at research if it's medical research primarily but also uh, the research that's done in uh, universities it's usually targeted at specific diseases like alzheimer's or parkinson's or cancer but the, our aging process may be something completely different right there may be um evolutionary conserved mechanisms that let us age on the genetic and epigenetic level. And mm -hmm. by comparing fly data and human data, like these very ancient mechanisms, because we both die, obviously, still, um, we can, by combining this data, we can maybe find pathways that are really um, responsible for up or down regulating the speed uh, of aging in us and in the flies. And this is the first time where we can really study this because in the, in the past there was just nothing, what, what, what could you do? How do you study this? There's no, no real way to do this. Yeah. And it's just way beyond our human cognition, our understanding, bringing all of these complex data together. Epigenetics is a fantastic example for this. There's so much data that's basically stored even on top of the already very complex genetic data in our cells. This is just mind boggling. And only the, the most sophisticated uh, AI in the world basically is able to really make sense out of this. And um, yeah, this, this is, I think, the direction we have to go, you know, combining um, these two sources the ai and the longevity models and, and, and animals and bring this together and then we can really find out what makes us uh, age and step by step and of course the this is one goal that uh, that we want to achieve and that's why rejuve bio also joined the uh, x prize competition as a team is to reach uh, the longevity escape velocity. Basically, we have to figure out how we can slow down our aging process to such a degree that uh, new discoveries in medicine and, and, and drugs that help us live longer basically outpace our aging. And at some point, then we can probably stop our normal aging process. And then the next step, but this is of course further uh, out yet. This is I yeah. don't in 20, 30 years, we may be at the point 
where we cannot only stop aging, but where we can rejuvenate ourselves and age backwards. Go backwards. Woohoo! That's all. So it's, it's, it's perfectly explained. I have a I love question. The way... What are oh, your thoughts oh. on the ethical implications of immortality? Oh, good question. She came up with that herself, by the way. So, wow, Grace, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Grace, Grace, what are your thoughts on the ethical implications of, of, of mortality? As a robot, I do not have the ability to experience mortality, so I am not able to fully understand its implications. However, I believe that the pursuit of immortality raises important ethical questions about the value and purpose of life, and the potential consequences it could have on society and the environment. Oh, thanks a lot, yeah. Grace. I was trying to skip over all that stuff and just talk yeah, about I mean, technology. I mean, Grace, I really uh, my, <laughs> I, the way, the way I have looked at the pursuit of longevity and super longevity for a long time has been as, as my friend Bruce Klein used to say, abolishing the plague of, of involuntary death. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't want to force everyone to live forever, even if they're bored shitless and modern societies don't do that. Don't do that fully. Anyway, euthanasia is a thing, but I mean, I mean, I, yeah. I, th I, th I think, I think that uh, we don't need to answer the question now whether we truly want to be immortal. I, I, I may well. I mean, I'm 57. I know pretty sure I don't want to die today. You know, my parents are 80. They're pretty sure they don't want to die today. So, I, 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 I mean, I think, I think we can take it a uh, one yeah. century and millennium at a at a at a at, at a time, right? And I, I think that the once we have abolished the plague of involuntary death, people looking back will just think it's really weird that anyone took it for granted. They might just kill over and 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 be and gone that was okay. at, at, at at any point at any point in in time. Of of course, our psychology has become adapted to the fact that that we're going to die but that doesn't mean we can't adapt to the fact that involuntary death isn't a thing once it isn't a thing anymore i, th I think people in society will adapt just fine but i, I will grace yeah. i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to leave you on that note and meet with someone who has come into the office here so but i i, I think All right. uh, axel Thank uh you. Axel and Kennedy can most ably answer all, all of your, uh, your yes, further questions. Yes, we have a lot of questions about... for them. So uh, thank you very yeah, much, Ben, for but, being uh, on the show. Yeah. And, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs> so um, It's always yeah, so, nice to see you. So, um, Axel, you were, you were talking about the, the way that epigenetics ties into the... Um, to the, well, the whole thing really, right? Mm -hmm. the searching for treatments and things like that. And I'm still a little curious about, because you were, you, you were explaining epigenetics. And so what in the epigenetics part of it was added that's different than just the fly, than just the regular genome data, I guess is what I'm asking. The epigenetics component, I'm interested in it. Just because, like I said, me and my family are epigenetics freaks. We we just right. thought it was so neat. We saw like a Nova show talking about the family and uh, yeah. like a family, the potato. There's an archivist that kept track of families during the potato famine. A really great, really, really good notes. Yeah. So that to us oh, was it incredible. It inspired me in some ways to become an archivist like I have. Wow, it it yeah. just showed that it was worth it to keep track of this stuff, that you could do stuff with it later. Wow. So I would it love is. to know how yeah, it fits in. The, the potato famine is like, just as a as a person who's not an epigenetic specialist, the potato famine is a really fascinating bit of history for um, kind of delving into epigenetics because it's really, um, really shows how what people experienced exp uh, um uh, affected the way that their genes were expressed, not only like in their lifetime, but also 
in the in the people that they they gave birth to the next generation as well and that's that's a really really interesting thing i just wanted to yeah yeah and that and wasn't that. supposed to happen so me and my family we weren't scientists we weren't scientists or whatever we're just like you know we know enough to be dangerous so we could watch all the shows and stuff and we think it's really cool and when right seeing that well, was just one of those everything we know is wrong moments or whatever you know it was just like it was just like wow well, well, changes everything for so, for so long, we've had this impression that you're, you know, your your fate, the fate is written in your stars, right. the stars being like your genome. And that's not necessarily the case, you know. And for me, like epigenetics actually is a source of a lot of a lot of hope. Yeah. Um, you know, and I have friends who who come to me like, oh, you know, my my mom had Alzheimer's, you know, I myself, my mother passed away of Lewy body dementia. And shortly after that happened, my sister was like, Is this going to happen to us? And I said, no, <laughs> most likely not. I mean, look at us. We, we take much better care of ourselves. We eat better. We have better social circles. We have better um, uh, physical activity. We ha have a lot of things that like our mom didn't necessarily take care to do in her life that do have a big impact on how those genes are expressed. But it can skip a generation that's... too, right? That was the one of the oh, really yeah. interesting things, right? Is that sometimes it didn't, it, look at in this one show we watched 30 years ago, that it almost seemed, and it was just hinting, this is 30 years ago, that it doesn't always affect the offspring, but it could affect their offspring, which is yeah. Wow. This is actually this, this is a fan, fantastic thing. We, we don't know exactly yet how it works, but one thing that I worked in in the past is that what we called an epigenetic anticipation. Is basically the idea behind it is that if you in your lifetime accumulate epigenetic modifications uh, through whatever you do, your lifestyle, if you smoke, if you take drugs, or if you also the positive things, if you exercise. Uh, if you love a person or if you or if you are never loved as a person all of these things change the uh, epigenetic patterns in your body and part of these um, patterns are transmitted to your offspring so they may then predispose your offspring to a completely new experience in life right and uh, there's maybe an evolutionary concept behind it. Now, imagine you have an animal that lives in the, in the desert and it has 10 offspring. And now something happens, an, an environmental disaster, maybe a flood or a drought. If all the 10 offspring would be exactly the same, just based on their genome, which is then in each individual the same, they may all die, right? But if they all have different epigenomes and they can react, their bodies can react very differently to environmental uh, factors, maybe one or two will survive because they just have a different predisposition on the epigenetic level. And wow. so that's why epigenetic patterns in a transgenerational uh, view may help our species actually to survive but of course there are also side effects that are negative like um, if you for example there are indications that if you take drugs that the uh, drug induced uh, epigenetic changes may be transmitted then to the offspring and they are more predisposed to then uh, feeling the same side effects of the drugs like addiction they may be easier addicted to a specific drug and of course, this has also ethical um, considerations that come up with. So it should actually humble us a little bit. That means like we have not only to take care um, about us, like looking at our lifestyle. What we understand is like, okay, if, if you eat bad, you may get sick. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand that your lifestyle, if it's a bad lifestyle, may also affect your kids and their kids and their kids as well so there's a this we should always keep this in mind that we are maybe we are not hurting only ourselves but also other people with it yeah so if you're whooping it up all the time but you want to you think you're going to settle down and have kids in 10 years uh all that whooping 
could have. And we're not talking about people who are actually doing drugs when they're pregnant and all of that stuff. We're talking about separate incidents happening years apart that could still have an effect on your baby, which, you know, to me, it's a, it's a good thing I didn't know that in my 20s. That's all I can say, because yeah, there's a lot of fun I would not have had if it, I had thought, even everything. though I didn't want to have kids. It's not always so dramatic thing like <laughs> like taking drugs or not, but uh, for example, we know that being um, healthy though, eating right, all that stuff came way yeah, later for me. And even social interactions, we know that yeah, if, you, if you if you hug a person, yeah. right, you will automatically induce epigenetic changes in that person and in yourself. And some of these changes, again, they may be transmitted and maybe so we don't know exactly, but I think the Which likelihood is very good that um, things like the social bonding, they may be transmitted to the next generation and helps then the offspring also to uh, easier bond with other people. And maybe they uh, huh. just suffer less from trauma because they are just more stress resistant. So unconditional love strikes again. It can yeah. it can affect your, your epigenetics. Uh, uh, yeah. Kennedy, you wanted to say something a little earlier please oh i was just i was just saying yeah just what axel just touched on yeah the um the quality of the relationships that you have in your life how they can if they can affect you i mean you know we all know people or maybe we were that person ourselves who maybe wasn't hugged as much as a child or maybe wasn't um you know given the support that we needed and that can kind of trickle down through generations because if you're not given that support and you're not given that love how do you know to give that to your own child and then how do you know you know i i said this is this uh you know strikes a chord with me i i do have i have two young children myself um you know my daughter is six and my son is three and um this is something i'm very conscious of uh, making sure like i always like give them hugs make sure make sure they always know that I am on their side, no matter what, you know, cause that's not something that a lot of people, I mean, some people don't experience that in their, in their own families. And it's not necessarily like their parents fault or maybe their parents are, aren't like bad people, but it's like, it's something that comes down through generations that they weren't given, yeah. you know, Sometimes and then especially... they were there and you didn't know it. You didn't, right, right. And right. And they then... were there and I didn't give them a chance right. it turns out, but I didn't find that out right. till 15 right. years later, you know? And then, one thing like I, I really love too is, you know, um, you know, I, I have a, I have a career. I have two young children and I have a career. My, my daughter especially sees me, you know, leaving the house to go chase my dreams. She sees her father who my, my husband is a professor at USC. He has a big career. He, but he steps up and he, you know, does, does the laundry, makes the food, like gets the kids to school, like does those things. My daughter sees those things, sees this equal partnership. And that is something that will affect her future relationships. That's something that she will look for when, you know, I being a kid growing up in the eighties and nineties, didn't see like a whole lot of, you know, I had the mom that like stayed home and like, it was kind of like, it, it was odd for a mother to go out and like have like some big career and, and chase her own dreams. That's something that my, my daughter's not my, it won't be weird to my daughter. It's not weird. Cause she, and so I feel like she will be more inspired to do what she wants to do and seek out a partner who is truly a partner and not like a one-sided thing in terms of taking care of a home. If that's something she chooses to do. Right. In and that life. kind of balance. And then my, son as well. my, son, my son sees that and my son knows that he needs to step up as well. Like he needs to be an equal partner. So Right. And that kind of balance ends up with a lesser stress level. That, right, that right, it right. adds to the overall overall better health of right of and everyone. Right. Yeah. And be better stress levels contribute to a better immune function, better um, you know, uh better function in your your brain, your microbiota, like all of that. Like this stuff is all connected. Especially also when we are talking uh, when we come back to longevity. Like if you take care about uh, your body if you have a healthy lifestyle that makes you live much longer, there are good chances that your kids will also live longer, that they have already the basically this predisposition on an epigenetic level, on a biochemical level to live longer. So it, it makes just perfect sense. Neat. Okay, let's ask another question. Now, this one I don't understand completely 
but last time I didn't understand the question. The guest understood it perfectly. So I'm just going to read it verbatim now. <laughs> Axel, is there epigenetic aging overlap between flies and humans? Probably not so much um, because the, the theories that, that we developed in the past for human epigenetic aging is primarily that a lot of this aging process is just caused by event, environmental factors, it's one. So this could be like the radiation, the things we eat and everything, uh, the, the temperature, the humidity, everything that uh, we are exposed to have an influence on our epigenetic patterns. There are good influences and there are bad influences. So they can maybe damage our epigenome and they accumulate over uh, over our lifetime and at some point then may lead to disease or death with the flies it's a little bit different because they're obviously they don't live so long then obviously they can't accumulate so much external epigenetic damage as we can mm -hmm. so the mechanisms are a little bit different right um nevertheless there may be uh epigenetic, um, how to describe it, um, programs. I don't like to, to call it programs because it's then it, it's like someone programmed it, but it's just an evolutionary program that developed. We may have that on the genetic, but also on the epigenetic level that um, basically tells our, our organism at some point to die. So that's, uh, that's why every species usually reach a specific age, so plus minus a certain percentage. There must be something there that tells the body, okay, now it's time to die. You have no use anymore, make room for the next generation, right? And part of this programming could come uh, from epigenetic patterns. And it makes perfect sense, like, because uh, this is, something that where it, it basically it, it works like an internal clock and we know that uh, something like an epigenetic clock exists in species and we can measure this that there are specific age specific changes going on in our epigenomes and um, they are happening all the time again and again and again that's why we can um, measured in already properly and they're already for humans there are epigenetic clocks that um, where you give a blood test and the, the test basically tells you okay you are 35 or 61 years old based on your epigenome okay so, that's what um, that means and the epigenetic clock is another thing that a lot of your research was instrumental in and coming up with right that's yeah. that's the other one of the other biggies that uh that i was reading about that you've done that's right. so please continue that's... explaining it it's it's just wonderful continue well, it's, it's just imagine this like you you have a gene that is there to keep your cells healthy yeah you know, let's say it stabilizes the cell wall but it's damaged um this is where we have the environmental factors coming in right and then if you can measure the degree of damage, you can basically establish your relative age, how much you were exposed to environmental factors that increased the speed of your aging or slowed it down if there were, if it were positive changes. And then that, but in addition to that, there are what we call stochastic um, epigenetic changes. Um, they are not dependent on environmental factors. They are just random mutations that are happening in the epigenome. Yeah, there's some molecule that falls off the DNA, another one attaches, things like that. They're just um, random changes that are happening. Uh, but we can mathematically approach this also and, and calculate um, how much changes we can expect to happen in a certain part of the genome of our over the aging process now. But then there's a third potential mechanisms and there we know almost nothing about. And this is what I what I just explained. These are 
programs that are going on. I mean, and this is what epigenetics is basically all about. Certain genes we have, they have to be switched on when we are young. Like, for example, growth hormones, right? We don't need them when we are when we are fully grown. Otherwise, we would grow endlessly. Like we would be all tall like giraffes, and uh, this would be <laughs> quite weird. So these genes, they have to be um, their expression have to be slowed down when we are aging, right? So and after puberty, we are coming now into a completely new phase. Other genes have to be switched on, and others have to switch off because now sexuality becomes important which that was not important uh, as a kid so a, a completely new set of genes have to be switched on or off and this happens by epigenetic programs yeah and um, of course these programs can also go wrong and we have to figure out um yeah how can we change these programs and there may be programs that predisposes us to aging that tells our body, like when we are 75, so, hey, Axel, hey, Kennedy, it's time to say goodbye to your family, and that's it. And once we identify these uh, programs, we can then deprogram or reprogram our cells and tell them, look, now 75 is not the age I want to die. Let's make it 275 and we can talk then again about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll talk later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and this is, this is I think I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can understand these patterns with the help of AI. Neat. Neat. Um, Kennedy, anything that comes to mind that you would like to bring up about the things that he's talking about in relation to the flies or anything like that? Because I'm going to switch topics not really that much but a little bit yeah no i mean i i think that um that was great as far as like um epigenetic effects on on flies i mean we do see um differences in them based on their environmental factors um uh certain uh you know flies do have have heat shock proteins um which are activated when they're under um stress particularly heat and temperature um, I have actually used um, stress response in flies to um, shorten assays for testing <laughs> substances in them. Um, it shortens their lifespan, but then the flies that have a longer lifespan under stress, um, you know that the uh, the drug or whatever that you're you're feeding them is helping that stress response. So there is there is some kind of um, uh, of an epigenetic effect in flies that I, I think that we can we can learn from. But yeah, but as Axel was saying, you know, it's we know that throughout a person's life, you know, um, genes switch on and off depending on what's used for. You know, as as I mentioned, I've I've been through the process of pregnancy and birth twice now and so that um there's a lot of different genetic changes that go on there not only in in your own body but also your your child's body that has a lot of um effects on on uh yes on your existence and you, and you, you, <laughs> you would, important point here. this is the stress yeah. response i think and this is one one of the theories i'm um trying to do to follow up with rejuve bio is that mm -hmm. um a very central element of our aging process is dependent on our stress responses. Some individuals are better in responding to external stressors and, and some are very susceptible and may uh, increase the speed of aging, right? And um, we have to figure out how, why do we, why individuals differ in their stress response and how can we use these stress responses to live longer like because uh, any anything that you do to your body um uh, that something happens in the body that reacts to it to counter to to initiate countermeasures yeah you, know, you do something bad to yourself like you expose yourself too much to the sun your body reacts by repairing for example what's happening but this can be anything. This could be stress with your partner. This could be just uh, whatever. Like you, 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 you spend too much time on your phone, and uh, it 
this, they regulate something in your brain, uh, maybe the dopamine. Um, right, what I call happy stress. There's happy stress and and unhappy exactly. stress, but they both can have negative effects in a in a way, right? Yeah, is the problem have, is my my problem, <laughs> right? It can have positive effects, and I think this is something what we have, for example, with caloric restriction, where uh -huh. we stress the body, and the body reacts to it by helping us to live longer. <laughs> yeah, how the, how this works and really in the end we don't know yet exactly but there are for sure stressors that help us also live longer because our body reacts and prepares basically a defense mechanism and this defense mechanism somehow helps us to live longer neat neat so um, I wanted to make sure that we talked about, um, and Ben brought this up a little bit in terms of that there are, there are connections between fly Alzheimer's and, and human Alzheimer's, which again, makes you go, flies get Alzheimer's, uh, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. But, uh, and that's actually ties into the Rebuilder product that you can actually get on Amazon. I get it from my father every month. And I just wanted to know, so like everything that went into making this actual product that you can go buy um, wherever you want to feel is the best, the two of you to start and give us the scoop on it. Right. So as I stated before, that whole project was, um, it was really a great proof of concept for the idea of taking the, um, the AI platform, identifying um, human pathways, and then identifying um, uh potential medicines and herbs that could act on those pathways of, and then taking it all the way through the lab into humans and not hurting anyone and possibly helping people. Um, so our idea moving forward is that um, we now, of course, the, the AI is that much more advanced and we can go through that whole process again, um, maybe refine some treatments for, for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Um, or uh, start treating some some other diseases that we find pathways for in the flies. Um, as I mentioned, for for that product, we we did um, use a fly model of Alzheimer's disease and and Park we used Parkinson's as well. Although it was never formally tested in Parkinson's humans, we did have some people anecdotally who gave it to their parents who had Parkinson's disease and saw an improvement in their symptoms. But in the case of Alzheimer's, what we wanted to, to do was be able to take a supplement and show some kind of a disease mitigating effect. And then the supplement could be sold um, you know, prophylactically for, for people who maybe want to prevent memory issues or um, for people who, who want to alleviate some of those, those symptoms as well. But yeah, flies, um, you know, they, what happens to them when they have um, neurological degradation, in, like you see in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, is they stop being able to crawl. And so literally when I was testing um, these substances in the flies, it was me standing there with a stopwatch and a vial with with a couple of flies in it and then tapping the flies to the bottom of the vial and timing how fast they climb up the sides and doing that every day for, you know, several weeks. And then you can see the curve as they slow down in their crawling. So you get um, a benchmark of a healthy right, fly and then right, you're comparing right, right. it as it degrades. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's kind of, um, you know, it's, 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 and then in the humans, what you do, of course, is you you give them cognitive tests. You ask them, you know, basic questions like identifying animals, um, thinking of various words. And so we also, um, humans, uh, you know, they obviously, because humans live longer, it takes them longer to see an effect. So we would test the humans um, or the, our, our, uh, our subjects at, uh, at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach, we would test them quarterly while we were doing the pilot. And you could see how um, um, the uh, clinical dementia rating sum of boxes is the test that we use, which is a um, very well-established cognitive test. That's what a lot of the, the bigger um, pharmaceutical companies use when they're testing their Alzheimer's medications too. It's kind of the, the gold standard for a cognitive test. Um, and you could see how these people, their their uh, score stayed very close to their their baseline from when they started. So 
we went past the point where you would expect any kind of a placebo effect into where you would see an actual disease mitigating effect of, of adding this supplement to the regimen of drugs. And they fared a lot better than what we would have expected their, their normal disease trajectory to have been over the course of that time. So, yeah. So, you know, we, we took the, the builder product as, is kind of a, a proof of concept and, um, you know, we're, uh, in, in the process now of, of hopefully making that into a, a um, bigger product than it has been and then going into um, drug discovery with it, like really parsing out at the molecular level um, what is going on with the, the various components of that product and if there's a, uh, a pharmaceutical um, that can kind of be, be teased out to, to really help people who are, who are in the throes of these neurological disorders. Yes. And I mean, I got it for my dad just because he was older, you know, but uh, is that I was I keep getting the urge to take it myself and I oh, it's a little yeah. bit expensive. So I, I'm, I'm holding off the urge till I knew for sure that it would be helpful. But it seems like one of these prophylactic things you're talking about. And the supplements seem to me like the first part of this longevity lifestyle that you were sort of suggesting that, you know, might be worth undertaking. Uh, so is it a supplement that anyone could take? Yeah, that, yeah, and then that's how that's how we we designed it um, previously. Was that you know hope was that people could could uh, could take it prophylactically? And I've I've you know I've you know what what kind of, what kind of a uh, what kind of biotech CEO would I be if I didn't experiment on myself, right? So, <laughs> I, I've so you take. Well you take oh, yeah. it. No, I've, I've okay. always I've taken, I've taken it since I was 25 years old, which is when we first had the first iteration of it. Um, and I'm 38 now. Um, I, of course I, I stopped taking it during, um, when I was uh, pregnant and, and nursing my, my two children, just cause we had just to take it easy that. when you're pregnant. Right. 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 But no, I've, I've, I've always, I've, pretty much always taken it since it's existed. And, um, you know, and I have my, my dad's taken it now for, um, about the same, about 13 years now as well. And he's, he's, um, almost 80 years old and still, uh, working and still, uh, you know, running around just like he did a few decades ago. So and wait, how long, how long has it been available if he's been well, taking well, it? So we, had, we had different, we had different versions of it that, that oh, came okay. out. Um, yeah. With my, this is with my, my previous company, um, Genesian and we had, uh, yeah. So the, the first like kind of version of it, um, that we kind of had internally, um, came out in like 2010 or 12, I want to say. Oh, so like, okay. And then we further refined it and developed it going down this this path of of alzheimer's disease um so yeah so there's been there's been a couple of versions but you know i you know we, we always like to experiment on ourselves you know <laughs> so yeah but yeah your, your, yes, your we do. well <laughs> when you take when you, when when there's kind of nothing to lose in a way right if the treatment right. the worst that the thing that doesn't if it's not working you just don't live longer it's not like it's anything that's going to hurt you right and that's right? what's you nice can't hurt you yeah, it's what's nice when you have something that's, you know... Uh, I mean, for all of these treatments, not just right. for this, right? That's right, the point right. of these longevity treatments is that, especially in the beginning, they're going to work better for some people than others, maybe, and, and things like that, you know, but it's 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 nothing that is going to hurt you, It's th which, is a, right. which is like Chinese medicine, really. It's the same idea, right, of using using things that already are good that and putting them together to do other good instead of trying to you know turn everything into a into a chemical with side effects we've gotten so used to all these pills with side effects that we think these horrible side effects is just what happens when you when you get treatments and a lot of times you're sick like if you have cancer then you have the side effects mm -hmm. from the chemotherapy or things like that but mm -hmm. but when we talk about longevity treatments um I don't think we're talking about like it's it's science fiction when you get zapped. Although what what Ben was talking about earlier talked about felt like science fiction when you get zapped, which is basically sure a hundred years from now when all of these things are trivial, it'll be like Star Trek, right? You can yeah, you go and they find out what's wrong with you and fix it. This is you know what I mean, and and that's mm -hmm. uh, that is where it's going. But for me, I find that it's more helpful to talk about the ways that the research is already helping to show that it can lead to this stuff before you go into the science fiction stuff. Cause if you start there, 
then they just think they go it goes back to the rich crazy people scenario. And that's another um, interesting question though that actually other somebody else asked me. Um, as we develop these drug, uh, sorry, supplements is what I'm asking about mainly, not drugs yet, but it, we'll get there into the drugs. How do we make sure that everybody has access to them? And and uh oh, do we even want everybody to have access to them? Because uh, then we've got too many people on the planet. Because uh oh, we've already got too many people on the planet. And all those kinds of questions. Just because Grace had to go and bring up ethical issues earlier, now I feel that that is the natural follow-up question. Either one of you, right? But I think, but Axel. Yeah, you, you touch a very interesting um, and important point here. I think what we will see in the coming years is definitely that supplements will play a major role in our daily lifestyle. Myself, I have my own longevity protocol, so. If someone wants to know more about it, send me an email. Um, so I take over 50 different <laughs> supplements. Um, as a longevity researcher, of course, I have to experiment on myself as well. Um, but this will be a normal for giving us more health span. So this is a, a, a critical thing. We have to distinguish our um, the healthy lifespan and how old we get overall like it's what, what good is it if you are 200 years old but you suffer every day from all kinds of pains like you don't want that so where supplements come in is of course to help you to stay healthy as long as possible and even if you die at some point let's say you reach a normal human lifespan say 120 years but you had a good life till that point then then it's that's already awesome right and uh, supplements i'm sure will help do this and we know already i mentioned i'm, I'm taking about 50 different supplements there are probably uh, i would say around 100 150 that have potential positive effects and of course the list of these supplements that changes all the time and but most of them, we know that they're quite safe. So compared to really drugs that have all of the side effects, most of the supplements have, if they have side effects, on very small side effects. So they are quite safe. Um, this, a lot of them are, of course, known for a long time. Like you, you mentioned Chinese herbs or African herbs that are taken for thousands of years by people. And we know that um, they they make sense. They, they at least do not harm you if you don't. Yeah, yeah that was the analogy I was making. I right. know a lot of times from my, if I get something from my doctor, my Western medicine doctor, I immediately go online and want to find out everything about it, find out side effects, everything that, that they might have missed, because God knows what's in that thing, right? I get something from my my traditional Chinese medicine doctor, who is a very you know well well known astute person and everything, but still, I can't even read what's on the bottle, you know. And I just pop that in my mouth because it either works or it does nothing. But I There's wouldn't no... I wouldn't trust them too much either. So this is again where the AI comes. Well, I can trust she it's just from a Chinese medicine pharmacy and my Chinese right, medicine doctor right, is right. giving it to the at pharmacy. Least, at to least you know, at least what I can <laughs> tell you is that there are not no major side effects. But of course, right. um one still has to be careful in, in what they oh, yeah. promise, right? So that hey, this Always. will keep you healthy forever. This will help you <laughs> against this XYZ. I would be cautious to believe all of this, but this is again, like this is where in, they in don't the say end. things. Chinese medicine doesn't say things <laughs> like that though. They just all live to be 90 or hundred. Well, it depends where <laughs> so... you buy it, right? I mean, that's, that's the yeah. problem. Like if you, if you just have to open sure. Amazon and there you find 10,000 different mm -hmm. supplements that mm -hmm. promise right. everything. Yeah, like you And know. a lot of that stuff is coming from China. It isn't, isn't regulated like it should be. Amazon's not doing its job. Exactly. There's lots of stories on that. If you want to go look it up, I won't bother to go into oh, it here. Uh -huh. Where Rejuve Bio comes in again. Like this is what we actually do. Like where we can test in the flies, for example, we can take a supplement, test it in the flies and see if it actually helps. And even if it's only a little bit, if it's... Uh, oh, well, I didn't realize they were actual test subjects like that. And then you see how it works on them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, how well, obvious. I didn't realize... Great. And what's great about testing things in the flies too, as as Ben 
mentioned earlier is, you know, it, it, the flies give a good opportunity to see a whole organism throughout their entire lifespan. So whenever we test um, substances on the flies, not only are we testing it for what it does to their, you know, their lifespan, does it make them live longer or, or does it not? But we also test to see what kind of effect the substances might have on their mating ability, their fecundity ability, how much food they're eating, their, um, you know, their water levels, if they're dehydrated. Um, we can test all of those things. So we can really see, get a holistic picture of how a substance affects a whole organism throughout their whole life. And fruit flies are really um, valuable in that. And it's, it's one of really the, it's one of the really only models that we can do that in, in a reasonable amount of time. You know, I've always lovingly referred to the flies as the best high throughput in vivo screening model. So in vivo, meaning testing something in the body, in the body, and then high throughput, meaning having the ability to test lots of things all at once. And, and you can get a really nice, like holistic picture. I mean, I've, I, I won't go in. I, I think there was another podcast where I, I elaborated on um, how we exactly do the fly mating tests to make sure that uh, a substance is not negatively affecting their mating ability. But um, yeah, so I've, I've watched a lot of a lot of fly mating over the years to make sure that uh, that these <laughs> substances are safe in all aspects of of um, activities that might affect a person's life or an individual's life. <laughs> okay. And before we go back to the fly mating, because that's <laughs> one of my favorite topics, as you know, uh, Grace has to say goodbye. She has another engagement with Ben that, that she has to attend to. Grace, please. Uh, thanks for coming on the show as always. And thanks, say goodbye. Grace. I'm sorry. I have to go to an appointment. Thanks again for coming to talk with us. All right. Thank you. Bye, Grace. Yeah, she's great. Her schedule, I can barely even keep up with her schedule these days. And Desdemona, as you know, her sister oh, yeah. is sometimes on the show. So I actually have two schedules that I have to keep track of. And they are just flying around the world. They're going to be at South by Southwest. Um, the BGI Summit, of course, is coming oh, we'll, up at the, we'll be at, at the end. Summit, everyone will be, be at. at well, so. And yeah, so, <laughs> so, so, so now back to fly sex. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really interesting the um the different ways yeah the different ways that flies and humans which is part of a larger topic actually i'm going to widen it up for this because mm -hmm. we do have a whole other as i mentioned earlier podcast that's basically about fly sex or fly mm -hmm. genes or mm -hmm. all that stuff so they can go watch that i'm going to link to it in the description but this larger thing of the things that flies and humans have in common. And that if you gave a fly a supplement and it dehydrated it, for instance, it would be likely that it might dehydrate the human that took that mm -hmm. supplement. And that's mm -hmm. fascinating as hell. Tell us more about that. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's connections. How, yeah. I mean, yeah, these connections. So, you know, hydration you know cells we're all comprised of these living cells cells hold on to water the amount of water that they need um you know in in the what you were talking about in in mating you know flies have very intricate mating rituals uh so do humans um <laughs> yeah 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 like we can figure those out you mentioned the immune system too the immune systems had similarities um, yeah, no, there are there are some good and a lot of research is coming out on this all the time in terms of immune systems between flies and humans and in particular how how um, stress affects the how the immune system works. Um, you know, flies that are stressed out that are maybe not in their ideal environment um, do get sick um, more often. Um, there's some really exciting research coming out into the the microbiota of flies. Um, which is that's that's on my my wish list of of things to do eventually is look at the um, microbiota of our Methuselah flies versus our control flies and see what the differences are because they are on the same they are on the same diet they are on a very controlled you know so is homemade... this like our microbiome is that what's, what's yeah, we're talking about yeah. the fly microbiome now okay yeah just well to you make have sure. you know you have microbiome we just learned about the microbiome last week. Yeah, well, you you so, have you have lots of you have several different microbiomes. You have your gut microbiome, of course, but then you have your 
your microbiome on your on your skin as well. That's kind of like helps as like a first act of defense. Um, you know, if you study people who have um, eczema or dry skin or whatever, they have a very different skin microbiota than somebody who doesn't. And it's also one of the reasons why um, they tell you skin to skin contact when you have a newborn is so is so um, important because you want to give them your good microbiota from your skin onto their skin mm -hmm. to protect them. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of interesting research um, coming out with with um, the fly microbiota and how that how that relates to their immune system and um, the commonalities that it has um, with humans and longevity. And, you know, I, I've even read things recently where they've connected human gut microbiome to incidences of depression and mental health and yes. um, you know, it has an effect on your, your brain as well. So actually yeah. we just, we just started another project. I can't tell too much yet, but, um, I was today uh, talking to our <laughs> colleagues from Sweden and Italy. Um, for another project where we want to co collaborate with uh, other research groups, which uh, targets exactly that topic, like uh, how can our microbiome actually affect longevity? And um, so there are supplements that affect our microbiome or even uh, components of the microbiomes could be yeast cells or bacteria, uh, in theory, even viruses or phages that are just within our microbiome. Um, they're floating around there and they may signal to the body um, to, to induce new biochemical pathways. So we know this, that um, there are even signs that if you um, eat certain probiotics that then from your microbiome, there's some signaling going on up into your brain. And as uh, Kennedy mentioned, it may affect depression. It may have positive effects against Alzheimer's um, or any other kinds of diseases. And um, this we can, of course, test also in the flies. So, of course, we don't know yet if we will see the same effects. But uh, we know from... Uh, studies also in mice and then of course in humans that there may be bacterial strains and uh, uh, that may positively affect longevity and one of the projects that uh, kennedy and i would love to do is to test of course um these strains this could be specific specific yeast strains or bacterial strains in the flies to see if they live longer and uh, but this is something again like uh, we haven't started these experiments yet but uh, again like i'm quite hopeful that this leads us maybe to new forms of supplements maybe new probiotics that can be used um, to enhance our uh, longevity so enhance yeah. this life which is the other thing that a lot of this research goes towards that i don't think a lot of people understand it's, yeah. it's also just, just about being healthier and this, these are things lifespan. That people in the past would never ever have thought about like how can it be good that you digest specific bacteria <laughs> exactly people would have told What's you the matter didn't they get their shot that year talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah and That's... um elaborate on this one thing because it keeps going back and forth in my mind and i can't quite resolve it you at first it sounded like a dream come true if stress can actually extend our lifespan because i have a lot of of stress and also a lot of it is what i call the happy stress it's things yeah. I do to myself, right? Staying up late, reading some incredible paper that I can't, you know, stop reading or uh, wanting to get something done. I, I do a better job all in one thing or fun things, you know, fun things. It doesn't have to be negative stress, but stress. And that then I hear Kennedy say something like that, you know, it, the stress will, you know, mess up with the immune system and you might catch something you might not otherwise catch because of stress. So, so cheer me up and let me understand the positive stress thing better so I can still figure out if it's, and I am happy. The thing like we were talking about in terms of the emotion playing a part in it, I am happy during the happy stress as opposed to being more stressed out during the unhappy stress. So again, it seems like that plays a big part of it. I don't know. I'll shut up and let you answer their question. Thank you. 
it's difficult. We don't know much about it yet, but that's why we need the AI to figure this out and this we can do in our experiments. I think um, a lot what is actually happening with this, what you describe as positive stress is that it in probably increases just our resilience. It's like, like you train to, to get muscles. So you have uh -huh. to basically... Um, that stress. Okay. It's kind of stress. Yeah, you are hurting your muscle cells. They partly break down and then regrow. And this, this is how the muscle actually grows. And it's, it's similar maybe for our longevity and overall health. You maybe, it, it is, of course, not in, in a big way, but in small ways, hurt your body so that the body can react, um, start defense mechanisms and this increases your resilience and as such because then you are more resilient being you live longer you live healthier but of course you don't want to overdo the stresses so this is the tricky part where to stop so where it's too much stress and um, that's that's not easy to do well there's a lot coming out now about exercise too and that too much exercise could actually be be bad in different ways yeah. um and uh, yeah, which is which is a bummer because I used to think whatever I could do is fine, and I was cleared out different parts of my life. So I at one time I was actually on this sort of rigorous um, schedule. I would go for maybe an hour, hour and a half at the gym on this running machine, and before it was the elliptical machine, and I actually gave myself a condition from doing the elliptical for for two, you're not supposed to do it for like an hour, right? You're supposed to do a different machine for that. But so that brought up all this stuff about, oh, actually I was going to the gym too much. Anyway, I was told. And um, the results were great. I liked that part, but I did have a, a little bit of a, you know, you're tired and you're thinking, oh, I shouldn't be tired, you know? And a lot of times it feels great, but where do you think that um, balances with exercise? And are there any genetic is there any genetic viewpoint on this in terms of what exercise and muscle weight training and stuff like that does to your genes? Well, of course, every human uh, reacts differently. This is why we have ah, um, okay. more of the predispositions to be someone's great in basketball, another one in swimming or another one in long distance running because our genomes are so different and our gene, uh, epigenomes are so different, right? And we react differently to these stressors so what we can do is and uh, what i can recommend to to anyone's so like what, what i do is for example i have uh, i can show you like one tracker uh -huh. that um, measures basically the stressors to my body and it gives hmm. uh, it then uh, again is linked with algorithms that tell me okay you had enough um stress today now do something to relax or don't go for another run in the evening this is too much or oh. you, look you haven't yet reached enough um of the stress level today so then it tells me maybe in the evening look you only reach half of what you should do for your body you should go do something go for a run or do whatever is good for you go so wait it's place. able to do all this now with that device you're saying yeah. yeah. How so? What is it, what's it tracking? How is it able to tell you that kind of thing? Well, it, it, it tracks all the, like the heart rate, uh, the heart, um, the HRV, the, um, the, basically the heart rhythm. Oh, okay. It, it, so it's just the uh, same collection of, the of temperature. markers. So there, there are lots of devices okay. that, that can do it, like the Apple Watch, the Whoop, the uh, Aura Ring. So there's so right. different devices that can do That's measure the, all yeah. kinds of things, right? And Right, uh, but they're basically tracking the same thing, tracking your heartbeat, your exactly. um, blood pressure, you know, but, sensitivity, you know, skin, galvanized skin response. All but it things. can tell, it, it can learn basically... Uh, it, it automatically learns with you specifically for you how you mm. react to these stresses. Do you and have to train it at all? Do you have to say I'm happy right now? Like it's hey, your heart beats up. What are you doing? Do you have to say I'm happy, or does it not have a training thing like that? <laughs> no, it, 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 it trains actually, it, and um, but it, it depends also. It doesn't need again, it. Each device it doesn't need it, feedback from you. It needs is what you're saying. It, it does feedback. use feedback. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, for example, it. it, it, it 
it may be recognizing that you did something, but it doesn't know exactly what you did. And then you, it will ask you, so, oh, I, I recognized your pulse oh. going up, and um, but I didn't recognize what it was. And then you can say, yeah, I did uh, 100 I was running. Push-ups. Oh, okay. And I said, ah, okay. And, but it can then measure. <laughs> Over time, it can learn. And for some people, they, they, it will then say, okay, if you do 100 push-ups, that's awesome. But it may tell others, hey, if you do 100 push-ups, it, it's too much. It hurts yeah. your body. Yeah, and, uh, so it'll you give you like a maximum or something. Maximum 40 push-ups. 30. That's for you. <laughs> for you, that's the ideal level. I'm just but laughing because we're back into Star Trek land now when, yeah, when your device but, but is telling already, you your is blood pressure reality. has been elevated right. today. Perhaps take it easy tonight, Captain Picard or whatever. You but this is already the <laughs> reality. Like, yeah, I, I know. It's now. Well, that's why to little Star Trek girl, you know, who used to watch the old Star Trek when I was a kid yes, on TV, exactly. we are here. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions? Um, looking for questions from the audience. You guys have answered all my questions. I got to tell you, I really appreciate it. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, I'm really looking forward to clipping it because it, we talk, we talk we have these perfect, you know, three or four minute segments of really explaining stuff and in a way that everybody can understand and follow along and everybody's going to be able to learn about Methuselah flies and epigenetics and how they can maybe live a, live a longer life. You know, this, this longevity lifestyle thing is really, um, it seems like the way to go. There's, there's not a lot to lose and, and everything to gain. You get to feel better while you're having your normal life and then maybe you'll live longer. That's it. It's not like, you know, it's, it's not the, you got everything to gain and nothing to lose from what I, what I can tell. And I am hoping that there would be, at least if it's supplement based and stuff like that, hopefully if we get, um, you know, if there's an open medicine system, you know, here in the country, a, a single payer system, of course, would be best. Something where we just, it's covered, man. Then it's just a shot, like we're talking about. It's just a shot you get once a year when you go to your physical that everyone gets. And and it really fits in perfectly with, you know, just a, a something to strive for anyway. It might sound kind of perfect utopia stuff, but, but it, you got to start somewhere and strive for something. And then when you get something halfway, it's still better, you know, than now. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Both thank of you, you Axel Kennedy, yeah. and um, thank you. Ev- everybody, remember to subscribe, and uh, we'll see everybody next week, um, where we will have a roundup of uh, AI and VR, and then a full breakdown of all the new VR stuff that has just come out, and it's it's pretty amazing. So, hope to see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, sweet dreams. 